Marhaban. Welcome. Willkommen. Um, I'm very pleased to see so many of you tonight for the second event of our Science Talk series. And before I start, I wanted to mention once again that this initiative is developed in collaboration with the Environment Agency Abu Dhabi, Emirates Natural History Group Abu Dhabi, the Natural History Museum Abu Dhabi, I don't know if I have to add that or not, but and Nautica Environmental Associates. So a big thanks to them. Thank you. Um, I guess it's not so much of a surprise to see uh, a lot of you here tonight because the, evening, the evening is focusing on sharks, um, those big fish that have quite a, 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 an important role and always been fascinating the humans and the human society in general. Um, and we will learn tonight, hopefully, that those big, this big fish have also a very important role to play in the marine ecosystems. Actually, I'm sorry, this is not what is supposed to happen. <laughs> um, actually, I did experience this fascination uh, through my sons last week. Um, and I just wanted to tell you about that little story because I was exploring the underwater of the Red Sea, the under underwater world of the Red Sea last week with my family. Of course, sharks were on top of the list of my sons to see, as animal, animals to see. And um, I can't tell you how happy they were when they saw two sharks swimming by, by us like this. This was just like the big highlight of five days in a row in the water. Um, I'm sure it's the first thing and the only thing maybe they, to they talked about when they were at school on Monday, back at school. Even so, we saw so many new fish that they've never seen before the pipe fish, the unicorn fish, the nice Picasso fish, but I'm pretty sure that they only talked about the two sharks that swam by us that morning. Um, so yes, I'm guessing that many of you here tonight have the same fascination uh, as my sons for sharks, so I hope you will enjoy. Um, we have three speakers coming to talk to us about sharks tonight. They are all researchers studying Elasmo branch, so the group that includes sharks. Um, and they will be talking about sharks in general, about um, shark population in, found in Abu Dhabi and the Arabian uh, region. We will be talking about conservation issues, about um, how important sharks are for the marine ecosystem in general. So, enough with me. I will ask um, Dr. Chilaspet, our first speaker, to come over and just to give you a brief introduction of um, Julia. Sorry. Um, so Julia is part of the Yassi World Research and Rescue team. She, she joined the team um, uh, a few months ago, uh, more than a year ago, and she has worked all over the world um, and has a PhD and, and carried out her PhD studies in Jeddah. Uh, at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Julia's research aims to protect and rebuild impacted Elasmogranch populations through, through the integration of ecological principles with conservation biology. And she has agreed tonight to speak, uh, to give us an introduction on sharks, biology and ecology. And you will see that, of course, that she will give us also an overview on uh, shark conservation and sharks of the Arabian region. So, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to that. Thank you very much for the introduction, Elise, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. As Elise said, it's really nice to see that many people being interested in sharks. And I hope many of you agree with me that sharks are very fascinating organisms. What I've always found most fascinating about them is their amazing diversity. And not only diversity in appearance, but also diversity in the habitats they inhabit, their diet, their reproduction, everything really, their natural history, their life history, their behavior. 
how many of you actually have an idea how many shark species there are in the world? <laughs> Maybe? <laughs> Someone? You? 4,000? Ooh, that's, that's a very high number. Maybe one, one more number. 300? <coughs> a bit more. So, sorry, let me use this. Um, up to this date, uh, scientists have discovered around 540 different species of sharks. And this number is constantly growing. Since I started studying sharks a little over 20 years ago, more than 260 new species of sharks have been discovered. And this is not because suddenly more shark species have evolved, but because the technologies scientists use to discover sharks are constantly improving. For example, now it's much easier for us to explore deep sea habitats. It's easier for us to distinguish genetically between species that look alike. And what I also find fascinating is, is that sharks have been around for more than 455 million years, which makes them older than dinosaurs. And all sharks share some very interesting features, which I wanted to share with you. For example, shark skin is made out of tiny microscopic teeth, the same material our teeth are made of. So if you run your hand from a shark's head to its tail, it feels very, very smooth, almost like silk. But if you run it from its tail to its head, it feels like sandpaper. It's very rough and you can actually hurt your skin. Their skeleton, unlike ours, is not made up of bones, but of cartilage, the material that the tip of our nose is made of or our ears. So it's a very flexible material that is a lot less dense than bones, which helps the sharks to move very quickly through water. Sharks have an incredible sense of smell. It's a lot better than the sense of smell of dogs, for example. And uh, many species actually rely exclusively on their sense of smell when they hunt for prey. Sharks also have a sixth sense. It's called the electric sense. And this works with very small, tiny pores they have all over their nose and their head region. They're called ampullae florencini. They are filled with gel, and they enable them to detect electric fields of living organisms, also some dead organisms like rocks, for example. For example, and so in theory, sharks could just rely on that sense, uh, close their eyes, not use their nose, and still find prey. What I also find really interesting is that sharks have several rows of teeth. So they don't have to worry about losing a tooth. It will immediately be replaced by a tooth behind the first row. So these are just a few interesting features that all sharks have in common. But there's still a lot of diversity among species, as I mentioned before. And there are a few species that I find have particularly interesting features. And I wanted to share with you tonight some of the species and introduce them to you. You probably know a lot of them already. So one of them is the Greenland shark. Greenland sharks are the longest lived vertebrates on Earth. They can live for up to 500 years. And they live in very cold water, minus one to minus 10 degrees, which is one of the reasons why they can get that old. They eat almost everything, from polar bears to other sharks to reindeer. But what I find most interesting about them is that most Greenland sharks are blind. They're not born blind, but within the first years after birth, small eye-eating parasites attach to their eyes and basically eat the eyes until the sharks become blind. So how do they hunt? As I said before, some sharks rely exclusively on their sense of smell. That's what these sharks do. Another interesting species you've probably all have come across already is the whale shark. Um, whale sharks are the largest fish in the world. They can grow up to 15 meters. They have over 3,000 tiny teeth, yet they only feed on very, very tiny fish and plankton, which are tiny organisms that are floating in the ocean. 
To maintain their size and even grow, they have to eat millions of these organisms per day. And they do that by filtering up to 600,000 liters of water per hour. So most of the time, they're just swimming around with their mouth wide open. Another pretty amazing species um, is the bearded wobegong shark, which doesn't really look like a shark. It looks more like a carpet. And um, it's very well camouflaged, very hard to spot on the seabed. And it's an ambush predator, which means it just sits and waits for its prey to swim past. And once it swims past, it just strikes, and goes for it, and swallows it whole. Not only small fish species, but also, for example, this um, spiny puffer fish, and even other sharks that are almost the same size as the shark itself. One of my favorite um, shark species is the great hammerhead shark. Because of the shape of its head, it has almost 360 degree vision. But it also has a lot more ampullae florencini, these small um, pores that are filled with gel and um, <coughs> enable them to, to um, sense electric fields. So it can actually find prey that's hidden underneath the seabed by this sense and doesn't need to to use um, its eyes or its sense of smell. Another shark you've probably all seen pictures of, at least, is the sand tiger shark. And this is a very scary looking shark that has razor sharp teeth, yet it's completely harmless. It only feeds on small crabs and, and fishes. But what's particularly interesting about this species is its reproductive mode. Do any of you actually know how sharks reproduce? Do they lay eggs? Do they give birth to life young? Both? Very good, very good. Yeah, yeah that's, that's also right. And we can discuss more about this because the reproductive modes are very complex and, and complicated, but we have a re reproduction expert here tonight as well, and he can answer any questions you might have later on. Um, but yeah, what's, what's particularly interesting about the shark is that sand tiger females, they have two uteri. And in each uterus are 10 embryos to start with. What happens then is that the strongest embryo, embryo starts eating all the other ones until only two are left, one in each uterus. So every two years, um, the female gives birth to only two very strong um, neonates because they've already eaten nine other sharks before they were even born. Um, and this is called shark cannibalism. Um, sharks are obviously not only interesting, fascinating, cool, but they're also extremely important for our marine ecosystems. And being top predators, they stabilize ecosystems by keeping the food web in check and maintaining their prey populations. So in theory, a loss of sharks may create an overabundance of intermediate predators, um, which in turn decimates numbers of grazing fish. And this, in turn, might lead to an overabundance of algae, which in the worst case can mean the death of entire reef systems. So obviously, what I've just shown you is a very, very simplified version of, of this process. And it really depends on the species. It depends on the ecosystem. All systems are different. All species um, have different roles in the system. So what we do know is that the loss of sharks will have dramatic and irre irreversible effects. What these effects are going to be exactly, we don't know. We will only know once sharks have been lost. But despite their importance, nearly one third of all shark species globally is now threatened with extinction. And um, the main cause for this is overfishing, which has happened globally for many hundreds of years. It's not only targeted fishing, it's also bycatch, which means people are uh, looking for other fish species, but Sharks end up in nets or in hooks. They are very fragile. They die if you don't release them immediately. 
Um, people might lose nets in the ocean, sharks get caught and drown. Shark finning, you've probably heard of, is also a problem. Shark fins are a delicacy in several countries, so people just remove the fins um, and put the sharks back in the water, which then die. So it is estimated that around 100 uh, million sharks are killed in fisheries every year. Um, it's obviously very, very difficult to come up with a number. It's just a very rough estimate. Unfortunately, the region is no exception. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Dira fish market in Dubai. It's a very important regional trading hub and the only auctioning site in the UAE where sharks are destined for international trade. So every day between 5 and 8 p.m., you find whole sharks and fins um, that are being auctioned there. Um, does anyone know how many different species of sharks are, are found in, in UAE waters? 30? That's, that's very, very close. Because not all of the sharks that we find at this fish market are from the region. So it's, it's very difficult usually to figure out where they're from because um, traders usually don't want to tell where they get um, sharks from. But a lot of them are actually imported from other countries and then exported to other countries again. It's not that they're all consumed here and all come from the region. But um, what we estimate um, so far concerning species um, in the region, and, and this is data we often get from fish markets, is that there are around um, 46 different species in UAE waters um, from four orders and nine different families. So compared to other regions, this number is quite small. So the shark diversity is quite undiverse. We don't know exactly why this is. Maybe it's, it results from the very narrow entrance of the Gulf, which might have prevented shark species from other areas to actually swim into the Gulf and extend their range. Uh, maybe it's a very special environmental conditions in the Gulf. We don't know yet. Um, but sadly, um, of these 46 species, only two species are currently classified as least concern by the International Union for Conservation of Nature in the region. So seven years ago, um, or six years ago, um, the shark specialist group actually met here in Abu Dhabi and we went through every single species that's present in the region and tried to understand um, its threat level, and then we classified them in different and, and on different threat levels. 26% um, are near threatened, which means they are doing okay right now. They seem to be doing okay, but they are very likely to be threatened in the near future. Even more, 33% are classified or categorized as vulnerable which means they have a very high risk of extinction in the wild. 26% are categorized as endangered, meaning they have a very high risk of extinction in the wild. And 9% are critically endangered, which means they have an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. So how are we going to help shark populations in the region. I mean, the best thing would be to just stop all fishing activities for a few decades, wait until shark populations have recovered, and then establish maybe some sustainable fisheries for certain species, but this is not going to happen. So what we can do as scientists is to at least try and figure out if there certain areas that are especially important for sharks. And one type of area um, that's very special for sharks is called um, nursery areas. And um, these are areas where female sharks give birth 
and the pups remain for several years. They are protected, it's usually very shallow areas um, near mangroves where they find plenty of food and are protected from larger predators. So if we were to identify these areas, it would already be a good, like, big step to protect them and make sure at least um, the maximum number of, of young survive for certain species. How you do that, um, you can use um, gill nets, scientific gill netting, which means you catch baby sharks, you put a little tag on them, you release them again, so you can monitor them over several years and make sure that the population is healthy and um, you get an estimate of how many there actually are. Um, more recently, people have also used drones. That works well as well. And um, Shamsa, our next speaker, is actually going to talk about um, many of the methods I'm going to introduce now because she's already doing research in, in these areas um, for her PhD. Another method you could use to figure out which areas sharks prefer or where they hang out most of the time is envi environmental DNA. And this is um, one of the topics we're going to touch on in the future. So environmental DNA is free-floating DNA that's shed by all organisms, for example, through skin cells or urine. So you can collect it by just uh, collecting a water sample and you filter the water sample, extract the DNA, sequence the DNA, and then you can either target specific species, so if you, for example, want to know if a particular species of shark is present in an area, you just look for that particular species, or you want to get an overview of all organisms that are around, uh, that's called metabarcoding, and uh, you get a list of species that are present in the area. It's also very important to know where sharks go and why do they go to certain places. So studying their movement is um, very important if you want to protect sharks because that gives you an idea which areas you want to protect most. You can't protect the entire range of sharks because they're very wide uh, moving species. Um, several shark species can move several thousands of kilometers within a few months. But usually there are areas where they spend more time in than in other areas. So knowing where they go and which areas they reside in, which areas they feed in, um, gives us a better idea of how to protect them. And obviously uh, most of you, I guess, are not shark scientists. So, but I'm still being asked a lot of times, like, what, what can I do to protect sharks? I like sharks, I want to help them. And there are things everyone can do. Be smart when eating seafood. Like, don't eat sharks if you can avoid it. And when you speak to your friends, I mean, there are a lot of people who are terrified about sharks. They don't want to have sharks in the water. Just tell them how cool sharks are, how interesting, how fascinating, and defend them. I mean, if you compare 100 million sharks that are killed by humans every year, and it's about one to eight or to 13 fatalities per year. That's nothing. And um, yeah, as I said, te teach others about sharks, tell them, I don't know, to, to read about sharks, to watch documentaries, not scary movies. And um, yeah, try to, try to change the perception of people when they don't like sharks. But in the end, I think it's going to come down to politicians realizing that live sharks are worth a lot more economically than dead sharks. And there are quite a few regions in the world where communities or even entire countries have realized that and are making a lot of money with shark diving tourism, for example. Um, it's going to take a while, but I mean, money rules the world, so it's probably the only way we can achieve proper protection in the long run. Thank you very much for listening. All right. Thank you, Julia. Um, all right. Nice talk. Now we 
uh, having our second talk of the evening with uh, Shamsa, Shamsa Alamani. Um, is a dedicated researcher and conservationist from Abu Dhabi with a passion, passion for studying elasmobranch species that inhabit the waters of the region. Currently, Shamsa is engaged in a research project aiming to address critical knowledge gaps and contribute to the bro broader understanding and conservation of shark population in Abu Dhabi. So I'm very, very pleased that she was able to come here, actually, because she is in the middle of uh, field work and she's just waiting for nice weather out there to go back uh, on a, a field, uh, field work to be able to, to continue and to carry out uh, her study. So thank you, Shamsa, for being here, first of all, and come on, on stage. As if I've been telling everyone, I don't um, uh, choose what I do during the week. The weather decides my fate. So I'll start with back in, by the end of 2018, uh, I was starting to think of starting my master program. And uh, by 2008, uh, 2019, I enrolled at UAU after hearing that Dr. Aaron would be joining uh, the university. Two months later, we, uh, I met uh, another team member, Stefan Bronze, and um, I would say that's the start of the dream team. So I will be going over some, uh, some of our findings um, during our uh, field work uh, in Abu Dhabi waters. So in Abu Dhabi we have various habitats and um, ecosystems including uh, corals, mangroves, seagrass, um, sand, uh, sandy bank uh, and sand beds, uh, seasonal algal uh, algal beds and rocky bottoms. Of course, we have other habitats, including oyster beds and uh, various other habitats, but we'll focus on these six. And when it comes to marine organisms, uh, different marine organisms would use different habitats uh, at different stages of their life. So a juvenile fish might um, be found around seagrass and then would move to corals once uh, they are adults, and same same is true for a lot of shark and ray species. Now, everything I will be showing throughout the presentation was shot in Abu Dhabi waters, by the way. Basically, our overall question, I can sum it up to um, what are the species we have in Abu Dhabi, where are they, and where do they go? Now, these are very important questions um, because in if we look back historically, we have a lot of shark species that were recorded, and actually we don't have them in our waters. But now, uh, like Dr. Julia mentioned, technology and uh, advancement in molecular biology, we, we are able to tell what species are around. And I remember Aaron asking me, what do you want to know? I told him I want to know everything I can know about sharks, but this comes quite close. Finding out where they are and uh, their movement patterns is very crucial for their protection. Now moving on to our study areas, uh, we have two focused areas. Uh, the first area was during my master's, which is an inshore area around Ras Gharab Island in Saadiyat. And the other area is offshore um, around the waters of uh, Jarnian Island. During our master's program, uh, master's research, we came across uh, a hotspot for two critically endangered species, and, uh, which are Halavi guitarfish uh, and uh, Pakistan with prey. Our findings showed that the Halavi guitarfish um, in, uh, decreases during summer and autumn, whereas the Pakistan with prey increases only in winter although they are still found throughout the year. And the findings of our initial study um, led us to more questions than answers, which leads us to our ongoing research, which includes um, an array of re receivers around the same area. And we tag the species using acoustic tags. Basically, any species, uh, any specimens that have these acoustic tags that passes by uh, one of our receivers, we would be able to, to, to tell 
what species, how long they've been around a certain area, and when do they go? And that starts to answer some of the questions we have about these species. Now moving 160 kilometers away from that uh, site, this is our offshore area around uh, Jardin Island. It has a various depth from zero to 30 meters, although most of our gear is deployed around uh, zero to 20 meters. Now this area is very special because it's highly protected and it's known for its diversity of seabirds, fish, and, and it's also a uh, nesting site for Hawksbill turtles. So if it's, it's, it seems like the right place to look for sharks. We use two main research gears, which includes um, a drum line um, and a baited remote underwater video system, or known as BROVS. Our drum, drum lines consist of uh, a block with two buoys and a circle hook. So once an animal is captured, it can swim around the buoy freely, uh, reducing the stress uh, on the animal. And we always uh, check on our lines once uh, we deploy them regularly to also make sure that we don't have any animals that are captured and under stress. The secondary method to assess uh, diversity and abundance is the beta <coughs> uh, underwater video surveys. Uh, it's basically cameras pointed at a baited canister, and once it's deployed, anything that is attracted to the bait is in the frame of the video, so we record anything that comes into the frame. We also have a third camera to the back for those uh, species that are camera shy, and we'd be able to see them as well. Now, real quick, once we catch a spe uh, an animal, the first thing we would do is tie them to the side of a boat, and we will work it up, collect any biological uh, data we need, including their length, tissue sample, blood sample. If the size is right, we would attach um, a satellite tag, an archival satellite tag, before releasing it back to the water. Now, uh, satellite mini pad tags uh, is the tags we've been using. And uh, again, Dr. Julia showed us another shark with so many piercings. <laughs> But this is the, the, the tag we've, uh, we've been using throughout our studies, and it's an archival uh, satellite tag. And I heard somewhere here they were asking about the other big tag that was attached directly to the dorsal fin. That's in the previous presentation. That's a, that gives you live, like a live information about the movement, similar to the ones attached to sea turtles. But the ones we've been using are archival. You don't need an explanation <laughs> with this by now. It's archival, so what it, what it does is it uh, records everything internally, and at a preset date, or program date, only if you're lucky, mm -hmm. it will pop up and send a summarized, uh, the summarized data to the satellite, which we would get later on. Now, this is a quick sneak peek of uh, one of the latest tracks we have. Um, it was attached to a black tip shark. And it's one of the longest deployment uh, dates we have. And not all of our data is that impressive, but I'm happy about this one. Uh, one of the very few summer data we have. You can see it, it kept swimming around um, UAE waters up to uh, June, briefly entered Qatar waters and came out. As soon as the summer hits, it started swimming uh, northwards towards Iran. And if we add one more layer to, to this map, we would see that it swam uh, to the deepest side of the Arabian Gulf up to uh, 75, and at some point it was around 80 meters of water. It would make sense for these sharks or and any other marine animal that's living in the Gulf to run away for the summer. Back to the cameras, the rubs, uh, we came across very interesting uh, findings. Unfortunately, we didn't catch these um, on our lines. Uh, this is uh, a guitarfish, smooth-nosed guitarfish, with a lot of copias if you're a fisherman. And a bow mouth uh, guitarfish tried to steal the bait away. <laughs> they do look like dinosaurs. And again, we have this in common, Dr. Julia. My favorite sighting was the great hammerhead. 
uh, around Jernin Island. Unfortunately, again, we did not capture any of those sea specimens, but just to know that they're around was, is, is uh, a nice feeling. This is where I will lose most of the audience, the DNA barcode. <laughs> Um, all of the tissue samples uh, we collect in field is directly transferred to UAU labs where we um, start analyzing them. The first thing we do is we ex extract uh, the DNA, uh, we amplify the targeted genes, gene, but we are looking at two genes currently, and, uh, and then we have the DNA sequence. Once we reach that point, we compare whatever sequence we have to a database, but we have a certain, uh, like a certain set of databases we compare to, to make sure that we're comparing it to the right, um, to the right animal. And it will either uh, verify or it's a different species than what we originally identified. So as an example, we have um, identified black tip shark we came across a lot of black tips, the limbatus, but some of them looked quite different, and we we were not sure if it is a black tip or not. After going through the DNA and analyzing it, turns out to be actually all of the black tips are actually just black tips. I was hoping for some gray spell over there. Um, what we originally identified as bull sharks in the field turned out to be that very close brother of the bull shark, the pig eye, um, as well as, oops, as well as uh, the Pakistan whip ray, we did the same process to verify its existence in UAE waters, and that was actually the first, si the first record of um, Pakistan whip ray in UAE waters, uh, extending their distribution from Pakistan all the way to the southern Arabian Gulf Basin. So in conclusion, you would, I don't know if you, if you realize that we kept saying a lot of critically endangered species in Abu Dhabi. Most of the species we came across is threatened, endangered, or critically endangered, including some of the videos we just showed on the brubs. That's because a high number of sharks and ray species found in our waters are threatened, especially the near shore shallow areas that are important for their uh, um, for their ecology is at high risk from coastal development. And we've see, we, we can see this all, all along the shore, including Abu Dhabi. Dredgers are just waiting around the corner somewhere. And large-bodied sharks um, undertake extensive movement uh, outside UAE waters. Uh, in our case, it went into three different, interna uh, three different regional uh, waters. So for conservation efforts, we would need to cooperate regionally if we are to think uh, to protect these species. I see a lot of students around here, and I really hope that you would uh, probably grow up thinking about these sharks and maybe major in the university, ecology of sharks or something here somewhere in UAU, NYU. We need more research done here to close in the gaps of the knowledge gap we have. It's huge and we need a lot of research to be carried out here. And I hope, uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. All right, well, this was super interesting, Sam. Thank you, Shamsa. Um, I think now, and I didn't announce that at the start, I'm sorry. Now will be the time for questions. So we, I will call Shamsa and Julia to come here, and I will call as well our third speaker, Dr. Aaron Anderson. Uh, so we, if we can move the, yeah, the seats. Sorry. And um, uh, just to introduce uh, Aaron to you, Aaron is, um, Dr. Aaron Anderson is an associate professor at the UAE University. Uh, in Alain, and he's actually the PhD supervisor of uh, JAMSA, so this is why uh, he mentioned him earlier. And as Dr. Julia said, uh, Aaron is a specialist on reproduction biology of elastomer branch. He's um, mostly focusing his work on the diverse diversity of uh, reproductive strategies 
found in Elas Point Branch and is using that information in order to inform conservation strategies and fisheries management. So I think he has a lot of interesting information to give us. So if we can move now just here, and I will open the floor to question. Let's go. We have two microphones uh, moving around, so first question. All right. Ah, Thank you. My, uh, my question, I think, would be for Dr. Julia Jordan. Dr. You spoke about threats, and you said uh, overfishing is a threat. And I think that's a well-established threat. We're seeing new threats today. And I, just like Shabsa said, encourage people to look at new threats uh, and, and understand, maybe you can shed some light on this. How does habitat fragmentation, and that's something happening internationally, will affect uh, sharks? Uh, I think it, it's going to be affecting all, 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 all different sharks. So, ha And how can we highlight that? in a m more obvious way that it attracts the politicians, the policymakers, to look at habitat conservation and ensuring habitat fragmentation does not affect these species. Very good question. Um, so habitat... <laughs> okay. Um, so habitat fragmentation um, usually impacts smaller shark species more because they are more residential or um, spend more time in coastal areas. Also it um, impacts juveniles or neonates, newborns more than adult sharks which move around more. Compared to overfishing it's still a relatively small threat, but you're absolutely right, it needs to be highlighted as well, especially in areas where a lot of development is happening all the time. How you can highlight it? It's difficult because you would kind of need to show what changes once a habitat is destroyed, um, which is not going to be a nice study, it's going to be very sad. Um, so ideally you would establish where you can find a nursery area, show that it's used um, by sharks over several years, then destroy the habitat and show that it's no longer a nursery habitat. That would be my first idea. Um, but maybe you can start by just um, communicating this scenario theoretically. Um, there are a lot of studies outside of this region that have looked into um, the impacts of habit habitat fragmentation. So, yeah, I would uh, suggest to use these as examples and then just highlight how how strong like the, the habitat fragmentation is in this area. Uh -huh. Do you want to add anything? No, I think <laughs> you covered everything. Shansa? All right. Next question? Sahara. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah, I'm a scuba instructor and my question is to all of you actually. I love sharks, that's why I'm here and I want to know, without joining a full-time course, how can we learn more about sharks in the region and how can we do our part to help conserve and research these beautiful animals in the sea? Um. Yeah, well, very soon there's a book coming out called uh, Natural History of the Emirates, which is edited by Dr. John Burt from NYU University. And we have a chapter in that on the sharks and rays of the region. So that might be a good place to start in terms of seeing what species we have here. We talk about uh, critical habitats and so on. So that might be good. I think we have some recommended reading in there as well. So you can kind of go deeper into things if you want after that. So that's probably a good place to start, I would say. 
Gina, do you want? I mean, there are also a few um, species identification guides out there, particularly for this region, which you can use. Or if, you, if you're not scared to look into the scientific literature, you could even read some scientific papers. I'm sure you would get at least the main message from them as well. And I had a like, follow-up question on that. Shamsa, why sharks? How, what made you come to study sharks here in the region? I, I didn't know that uh, speakers are allowed to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's more than one answer. Uh, I've, I've always been fascinated with everything to do with marine. Um, but slowly, it, I went towards the sharks. Like uh, There's a story I heard about my grandfather there's actually a story where I was still in school. I did a project about sharks. I emailed Her Excellency, Razan Lambarak. And within the same day, she sent me everything she knows about sharks. And I was very grateful for the data she gave me. But I also realized we had a lot missing and a huge knowledge gap when it comes to sharks. So, um, and ever since I knew that we had sawfish in over 12 years I've been looking for one alive sawfish. I'm losing hope now, but <laughs> but it might they, we might come across one last sawfish in <laughs> the region. Um, but that's it. It's more than one thing. But I've heard from someone who knows Shamsa very well that from a very young age, she would keep a diary every time she went out to sea or anywhere near the sea. <laughs> and. That just shows that there was an interest there from very early on, so I don't think it was something that came later in life. I think she always had this interest. Nice. Another question? Yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. Um, Julia, was it? You mentioned about the um, shark finning and that there's, these are still available in I think Dira market. Um, I was under the impression that, that it was sort of being banned everywhere in the world. I used to live in Hong Kong, and I think it's been banned there. Is are there any is there any talks with the uh, Dubai municipality or the government here in in order to ban this practice? As far as you, anyone knows, maybe actually you know more about this. It's, it's more of a federal thing, but they uh, you're not allowed to capture sharks for maybe just uh, cutting the fins off. So that is banned. That's as far as my knowledge goes. Yeah, but also um, remember, not all the shark products found at the Dubai market actually come from the region. So, as I said, a lot of products are imported from other countries. So, for example, from Somalia, if they um, fin sharks in Somalia and import the fins to Dubai and then export them to Hong Kong, it's yeah very difficult to figure out where you actually have to place the ban, because it's not banned globally, for sure not. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we, yes. The, no, just here. The gentleman. Um, so, like, why, why don't people, like, take matters into their own hands? Like, you can map out areas with endangered species, like, why don't people do this? You can map out areas where there are endangered species to help with research and development. Why, why don't they do that? Yeah, I'd love to do that, really. <laughs> I wish it's that simple, but uh, maybe you can, you can help me. What's your good name? Yeah, you can help me. It's a, it takes years of surveying the area and knowing the species, no? Interested? Uh, I have a new volunteer. <laughs> yes. Um, I would like to know um, what you do with your findings from tracking sharks and how it can help marine biologists to save the ecosystem in the future. What a question. Right. Um. Well, the first thing we do is spend a whole lot of time analyzing all the data. 
and when it begins to paint a clear picture for us, we write what's called a scientific paper, and we submit this to the journal, and they make it available for other scientists to see. And then when people in the government are making regulations about conservation, they refer to these papers that have been published, and they hopefully use that information when they're putting conservation laws in place. So it's a long process from the time we collect the data to the time it gets used by somebody to make legislation can be a number of years, unfortunately. But that's our hope, at least, that we collect useful data that can be used by other people in conservation. Mark, over there. Hello, thank you for excellent talks. My name is Mark Beach. I'm from the Natural History Museum, Abu Dhabi, and head of archaeology. I'm also lucky I get to work with Shamsa and Maitha's cousin, Nora Al-Hamali. So they're, uh, they're actually all connected to sharks. Um, I'm, my second job is I'm head of archaeology. We have shark remains from uh, up to 8,000 years ago from the islands, exactly from uh, Marawa Island, Gaga Island, so these various islands in the western region, we have, they made jewellery out of shark teeth, so making holes in some of the shark teeth, so we have evidence of, of uh, different carcarina species, we have tiger shark teeth drilled through, so they were walking around wearing macho type necklaces, so they've been in, people have been interacting with sharks for 8,000 years in, in Abu Dhabi, which is interesting. Um, I had a question actually for, for Maitha. The conventional wisdom about fisheries biology is that when it's the hot summer months, fish usually go to deeper waters. And your tracking data was really interesting, showing them moving, actually it was September, October, November, Timing, I think. From it starts from March all the way. Starts to from March. Okay, so it is it is the hot summer months that's driving them to the deeper water off the Iranian coast, then, because it seemed to be like the, they seem to be moving there in in the sort of winter time rather than the summer time, because the f from the point of view of other fish like tuna and canad, kingfish, these things, they all in the hot summer months tend to be in the deeper waters because the highest catches of them are in October, November, December when it's the cooler weather and they're n easier to catch nearer the shore and your data seem to be showing the opposite but maybe I misunderstood the, the graph. You said it, the movement begins in March, you're saying? Yeah, I think this was the, the track of the black tip. Yes. That went to Iran. But it was actually during the summer months that it started to move ah. away from Abu Dhabi and okay. north. Between July and August, uh, it was okay. already in waters deeper than 70 meters. Right, because I wondered if there's a feeding reason for that to the Iranian side, because the Iranian side has higher biodiversity and the richer water, and there's more feed and stuff there. It's not, it can be temperature related, but also food resource related. We had a quick look at the temperature, and it seems like there is a limit to uh, what they're tolerating. And I should just probably add that Shams is still analyzing all of our data, so we're not quite sure yet. But we have another similar track from a wedge fish that went up to Iran as well, and that definitely seemed to be feeding because looking at its depth profile, at night it was going up into the surface waters and kind of oscillating there before it would come back down again. And they feed mainly on crabs, and crabs tend to come up in the water at night. So it seems that that, that at least was feeding what was going through there. Whether the other sharks are doing this, where we don't know yet. Anyway, we need to do a collaboration looking at ancient shark um, DNA and the more recent samples as well to check if the species are the same or changed. You know. Absolutely, if we're interested in all collaboration. Thank you. Anyway, all great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, my question is for Shamsa. You asked us that you said that there is a lot of data missing, and you want us to study my marine biology or about sharks in general. I was wondering, from your point of view, how are you going to encourage us to uh, further greater um, conserve greater effort to learn about sharks and our environments in the UAE. Could you repeat the last part? I want to know how you're going to encourage us to study marine biology 
and help conserve the ecosystem in the UAE? Yeah, I just have one simple answer. Imagine you work in a place where you do what you love. It's like I, I do it for free. I don't feel like I'm going to work when I go to work. And if I could just add yeah, 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 of course. I think as well you have to have a passion for doing this because it's not something where you go to the office for a few hours every day and that's your job. So for example, Shamza might be one day doing something in the lab and then she gets a notification that one of those satellite tags has popped up offshore. She has to find somewhere along the coast to go to get a boat to get out of that and recover it, come back in and then there might be other work you know, planned. So it's something that you have to be really passionate about and not think of it as a job because it's not between you know, 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Julia, do you want to add anything about that? Yeah, <laughs> I think they covered everything pretty much. Yeah. I mean, do what you what you love to do. If it's studying sharks, study sharks. If it's studying something different, then do that. But just listen to yourself and find out what you really want and what what you're really interested in. Because otherwise, you won't be doing a good job if you're not really interested in it. Especially in science, because it takes a lot of effort as they've already mentioned, like to get this data, to see a project through, to publish the data. So you have to have an interest in the topic. Mm -hmm. Is it on? No, it's working, yeah. So my question is for the students. How many here want to grow up and work with sharks in the future? Okay, we have one, two. That's good. Okay, now back to you guys. <laughs> so for them, what's your advice on uh, the areas they should focus on in school right now? All right. Maybe a uh, question for you, Anwar? Sure. Since you are well, uh, university. <laughs> That's actually, a, that's actually a tough question because it really depends on what aspect of the biology you want to get into. Because there's a whole array of things ranging from ecology to molecular biology. But I'd say if you're in school and you're looking towards university, obviously just general biology is important, but chemistry is extremely important as well. But then mathematics is very, 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 very important. A lot of people who go into biology go there because they're maybe scared of all of the you know, calculations in chemistry or physics. But, but when you get into biology, you realize there's just as much there. And especially if you're interested in studying the movement patterns of these animals, you need to use a lot of complex mathematical equations, a lot of calculus and so on. So mathematics, biology, and chemistry, I'd say, are the, the three important things. Yeah, well, statistics as part yeah, of mathematics. Yeah, exactly. You always have to Obviously. Play with data, and playing with data means mathematics, right? Uh, yes, we have a question over there. Can Hi, my name is Maya, and I'm wondering, what shark species are humans target? You mean yeah, you what, what, uh, what humans, which species humans are mostly interested in in catching? Yeah. Okay. So it depends what they want to do with the shark. If they want to eat the meat, there are certain shark species that taste better than others. I actually am not an expert on, on shark meat. I don't know which, which ones they um, like to <laughs> eat most. But if, for example, if if they're looking for fins to make shark fin soup, they always go for the biggest fins. So the great hammerhead you saw before, they have very, very big fins, and they are very sought after when it comes to sharks because they get the most money from, from selling these big fins. So yeah, it really depends what you want to do with them. Some, some people target baby sharks because, I don't know, maybe they taste better than others? <laughs> Maybe you guys know. It's, it's our local dish is actually smaller baby shark. I don't eat sharks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Now it's on. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, I live on Sadiat Island and we have a lot of wildlife. We have dolphins nowadays every day, sometimes twice a day. We have turtles, we have snakes, we have uh, a lot of things. Uh, usually when we see a snake or when we have a turtle, something's wrong, we call someone. It, it, are we also supposed to call when we see a shark? Or can we just let it be? Um, or should we inform someone that it's there and they come check on it? Or, or is it okay and we just need to leave it alone? You usually just leave it alone, it's gonna go. But the person uh, that gets contacted is my sister right here in front of me. And if it's a shark, I, I immediately got that message. Uh, there was a sighting of uh, something today around yeah. the sand, yeah. It's a, it's the halabi guitar fish, looks yeah. like, uh, yeah. v very, um, yeah, very friendly, but it's good to keep a distance from all wildlife, just to not to, not to add stress to them. Yeah, I guess one, I would add to that, the, the main thing is just to make sure that to not interfere or to not just go and try to touch it if it's too close to shore. And then, and then if, if needs be to call uh, EAD, EAD as, a, as a line, 800-550-555, that, something like that? Yeah, okay, my side doesn't know. <laughs> but yes, so it's, uh, to call EAD and Mesa and Shamsa will, will come and, and assess. Uh, all right, over there. Hello, my name is Mohammed Al Yafri, and I work for uh, Sadiat Management Office. I was going to ask for right. them because, uh, as a matter of fact, we're expecting. Uh, we we just had last uh, the past two weeks snake attacks in uh, the shore, and we had a whale before. If you recall, like six months back, and uh, we're sort of expecting sharks to come to the shore. I'm not pretty sure yet, but every time we reach uh, environment uh, uh, EAD, we get to be a, to be frank, uh, a big answers about staying away from the snakes, don't get close to it, and let's be frank again, not all of us are passionate about sharks, especially the residents, but we need to have a certain or a set of guidelines that people, random people, swimmers, needs. What do they need to do at least when? I don't know, a, a different kind of species uh, of sharks is coming to the shore. So they need to know at least, in my opinion, uh, like certain of uh, precautions that they have to take. So is there any initial to uh, from the EAD or uh, from the uh, uh, whoever dedicated for that yes. to be distributed because still, uh, we're doing our best to uh, uh, to have a safe environment and uh, safe uh, swim for the residents, everyone. So that sums up my question. Yeah. Uh, but before Mesa starts, <coughs> it's their habitat first. I have to say that. And then, there you go. Let's see where <laughs> Thank you, Mohammed, for your question. You told me you're from where? Saadiyat Management Office. So with Saadiyat Management Office, we're always in touch with people from a dump, and we give them all the instructions. Why we say keep the animals, stay away? Because like Shamsa said, that's their habitat. That's where they are. That's their place. Uh, EAD cannot come and remove an animal from its habitat because we're worried about some tourists swimming. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm saying it frankly, because that's, it's a protected area. <laughs> Saadiyat is a protected area. So it's, and, and, and it was declared as a protected area because of the habitats and the diversity it has. With, with sea snakes, I totally understand your fear. Just to be very, fr very clear, sea snakes will never attack. They will never attack unless you actually strangle it, hold it, and shove your finger in its mouth. <laughs> and, but that's, that's because they, they lack that muscle that, that will retract their fang. They're not like normal snakes that can retract their fangs. But still, we do respond to that. We collect them. Uh, we have support of SeaWorld here. We do come out, collect them. SeaWorld collects them. National Aquarium collects them. Because of that fear, because of the fear that the public has. But uh, for example, when the orcas were, were, were here, 
there was no need to close the beach. There was no need. There was no need. Uh, humans were never uh, the, the they're th never on the menu. Exactly, they're never <laughs> on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, our relationship, I think, with Sadia, not only not only Sadia management office, but also to the uh, the uh, head Sadia management office. So the, we're always trying to be as responsive as possible, but also we need your support. We need a focal point, a fo single focal point. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Sea snake is the most difficult thing. Yes. 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 We could do public awareness sessions that are open to the public with workshops. But please contact us. Inshallah, once we're done, I'll exchange contacts with you. And make sure that happens. Because we do that on an annual basis for all the hotels and everyone in the management of, of the island. And, and just to, to add to that, I guess you're here as well tonight. It's part of that work that we are trying to do, awareness and, and, uh, and outreach, or just giving information about the species to the public, uh, and so a place less, like here, like the Yassi Ward Research and Rescue Center, it's one of the missions that we have, so we're happy as well to help on educating as many people as possible. All right? Ah, Just to add to the responses, you really don't have to worry about there being lots of sharks coming close to the shore, because unfortunately, the populations have been decimated. Because of the heavy fishing pressure in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there are very, very few sharks left in the coastal waters. That's why we study the inshore waters and the offshore waters. We find the bigger sharks way offshore, but the inshore areas that are easily accessible to fishing activity have been decimated. For example, where Shamsa did all of her master's work, that used to be a nursery habitat for sicklefin lemon sharks. There's footage from the 1970s that show fishermen going after huge schools of uh, juvenile sharks, hundreds of them. Now, there's not a single one of those there. In all the work, we've been working there now for four years. Like, regular field work, we haven't come across a single lemon shark in that whole area. So, it's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, we go looking for these things and we can't find them. So, I think for, you know, your guests that might come across them, I think it's, it's not that likely. All right. Yeah, Claudia. I'm uh, Claudia Schreiber, the chair of the Natural History Group, Abu Dhabi. And I, would, I have two things, to, one to share and, and one to ask. Um, one of our um, members, Amelie Mouton, she uh, recognized a while ago that uh, there is uh, a film from a French oceanographer on YouTube from 1954. And it shows plenty uh, sharks along the coast of Abu Dhabi. And she was asking, where, where are the sharks all gone? And actually, you answered already this question. So there is still a document of, of high numbers of sharks that have been here and have diminished due to overfishing and, and, and killing. And yeah, if you are interested, I can share this, this link because she asked us, where, where have all the sharks gone? Can anyone answer this? And also in connection with this, the question, uh, the pearl divers had been often uh, attacked by sharks. Which shark was responsible for it? Was this the tiger shark? And um, the other question connected with this, um, you said we have um, no bull sharks here, but pig eye sharks. So the pig eye shark, does it have a similar behavior like the bull shark? Because the bull shark is also known as a shark that easy attacks in, in contrast to most of the other sharks. And this area um, 
offshore Emirates Palace where they say there is a nursery ground for bull sharks. Is this then the pig eye shark? Just that. On that <laughs> last one. Well, well, I'll just jump in. Yeah. It's not that we don't have bull sharks here, it's that the area we were studying offshore, what we thought were bull sharks there were all these pig eye sharks, but there is certainly bull sharks in the Arabian Gulf as well. Uh, so they are there. About the behavior of pig eye sharks, nobody knows because it's a really, really understudied species that has a much uh, smaller geographic range than bull sharks. You know, bull sharks are very well known, they've been very well studied, but the pig eyes, nobody knows much about them. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think the archival satellite tags that Shamsa has put on the pig eyes here might be among the first uh, pig eyes that have ever been tagged with these types of tags. Um, but you also ask about the differences in behavior. Um, so most bull shark, most human bull shark incidents, I don't want to call it the text, but um, happen in very murky estuarine waters because bull sharks um, can swim up rivers for hundreds of kilometers and that's where they spend a lot of time. So it's very murky water, they can't see, they can't identify as a, a human, as a, a fish or whatever. So it's more like accidents that happen. Um, humans are mistaken for prey species. Um, I don't think that would be the case for pig eye sharks because um, they use different habitats. They, they don't need um, fresh water areas. They don't spend time in them. So yes, there are differences. So the shark jumped on the boat, or how did it attack the So what you're talking about is not an unprovoked attack. The the shark was, as you said, yeah. probably in, in a net, caught in a net, in yeah. a, in a no? fishing. Oh. Harpoon, yeah, with like a harpoon. So okay, but there was an interaction between the shark and the human. Mm -hmm. So the shark obviously panicked, tried to, no, okay, oh, sorry. Mm. Good. Interaction there. Well, I guess we would need yeah, more information on, we, on the yeah. incident too. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we'll take one more question, two more questions. Let's do two more questions. This side, sorry. Hi. Um, my question comes from Dr. Julia's presentation about ecotourism and the focus on they are better alive. And yes, there is a human component of monetary gain. Uh, what are things that we could do to focus on safe ecotourism for sharks? Um, and is that a possibility? Here in the region? In general, but yes, here in the region. Okay. I mean, in the region, you would have the problem that there aren't really enough sharks around to, <laughs> <Seven>. <laughs> um, yeah, to offer this activity. Um, but in general, yes, there are lots of examples worldwide for safe ecotourism with sharks and um, either snorkeling or diving. Um, you've probably also heard about um, shark feeding sites. I mean, that's a bit controversial, but it works at many places. Uh, so yeah, and, and it is safe. Sharks get used to being around humans and they don't see them as prey and just coexist, basically. For sharks more spe uh, specifically, okay. like their safety rather than 
humans being in their habitat? Is it safe for the sharks, for humans to participate in ecotourism? Yes, I mean, Great. as long as you don't interfere with the shark's behavior, you, you shouldn't touch it, you shouldn't swim it in its path, just let it be, like, watch it from a distance, that's totally fine. But, I mean, I would not recommend what some influencers do, like, trying to swim with big white sharks, grabbing the dorsal fin and riding the shark. That also portrays a very wrong picture of sharks because they still remain big predators and we should respect them as that and, as I said, not interfere with them, just watch them from a distance. Yeah, and so to add, I think, uh, just yes, we have a question over there and we'll go this way after. Okay. Hello, my name is Amber. I would like to actually ask you like when there's a fish under the sand how is actually good a shark when he's hungry go to attack the fish how it's going to attack it you mean after it has sensed that it's there mm -hmm. it's just gonna put its nose into the sands and dig up the fish and eat it because uh. <laughs> usually they're not very deeply buried in the sand they just under a small, like under a, a very thin layer of sand, and it, it it's not difficult for the shark to get to it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, over there. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm from Natalie History Group. Uh, as the population has been decimated, um, I'm wondering: is there a program where? Uh, the shark that are born in captivity can be released in the wild, or it's difficult, I mean, at least in UAE. Thanks. Well, the, the thing about it is when it comes to reproduction in mm. sharks, they tend to mature very late in life, and the, the live-bearing ones, the ones that give birth to, to live um, offspring, they tend to have quite long gestation period and they give birth to very few young. So you would need to have these animals in a captive environment for a very, very long time just to even get a small number of offspring from them. Uh, yeah. So it's not really feasible from that regard. Uh, but the, there are some species that reproduce very readily and produce lots and lots of offspring and you can release them back into the wild but they tend to be the species that are not particularly threatened in the wild to begin with because yeah. of their high reproductive output. So it's something that aquaculture has looked into a lot as well, whether you can raise them in captivity and, you know, and have a, a product that you can sell. But just because they grow so slowly and mature so late in life, it, it isn't really feasible. Okay, so there is, uh, it's not possible. Uh, the only way to act is to prevent fishing or to have a sensible fishing to reduce the number of, uh, to increase the number of, of shark in the seas. Well, they would be the main things. But one thing was kind of mentioned as well is the habitat. You have to look after the habitat, not just the sharks themselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, all around the Arabian Gulf, the coasts are getting developed you know, at a very fast rate. And this disrupts things like the mangroves and the seagrass areas and the coral reefs. So yeah. it's a case of taking a holistic approach to marine conservation rather than just stopping the fishing of one or two mm -hmm. particular species. OK, thank you. Thank you. One more question. Yes. One more question and then uh, the speakers uh, will be here. So you can just, yeah. uh, thank you so much for this uh, amazing talk. Uh, I have some good news concerning sickle and lemons. A juvenile was rescued last year in Abu Dhabi. Around about the, uh, we have a, a good way to, to... I've got some good news with this. Throughout the centuries, the mode of fishing locally was the Hadra system. a sakral, and you get to pick which fish you can survive on that day, and then you can release everything back into the sea. You don't drop nets, you don't, you don't kill fish or dump them that you don't need. And when, what happened recently, um, in the past uh, couple of years, a lot of the fishermen were getting interested in this conservation and working together with it, sharing information, sharing traditions, 
and filming and documenting the good news of the increase in sightings. Um, Bowmouth guitarfish, for example, also called the shark in some books, uh, there were three sightings last year in Abu Dhabi and in Kuwait. And uh, these are people that are sharing it in social media, it's in Arabic, but the people are interacting. And the good thing about the Hadra system is you can, with knowledge, you can choo uh, choose which, uh, for example, someone asked what's the most important commercial shark in. It's, um, it's called baby shark, it's not a baby shark, it's an adult, small size. The milk shark and the hard nosed shark, these are species that need management, but these are the main focus. The other big ones, the problem with the big uh, species is the international trade in films. And that's a big problem. But there were solutions. Um, and the good thing is the, is the locals are interacting with conservation and they, uh, uh, they've been seeing a lot of sightings recently and that's the good news. Yes. All right, thanks. Anything to say over there, Shanza? No, all right. We're gonna stop now. Uh, I know that there are a lot more questions and we could go on for a very long time. I'm sure if you have specific questions to the speakers, I will most probably be here in the next five minutes so you can come and ask them. But so thank you again for coming. I hope you enjoyed the evening. I hope you had a lot of information. And like uh, Dr. Julia said earlier, just uh, go out and, and protect and, and talk about sharks and, and, and defend them. Um, I think that would be the message of the of the night. Okay, thank you, everyone.